welcome to Barrier Temple International Church's podcast. I am your host, Timothy, and we're here together on this beautiful day to hear from God. Today, we're fortunate to have our beloved pastor, Mike Gonzalez, with us, who will be sharing God's word. So let's all prepare ourselves to receive what God has in store for us today. Let's begin. Well, good morning, church. This is church coming and meeting the Holy Spirit, coming, expecting God to meet you where you are, with what you are, whatever you have, whatever you don't have, he's willing to meet us where we are. To our visitors, this is church. Welcome home. We believe in a divine presence of the Holy Spirit that dwells among His people. And you will see, if you are new or or just newer with us, you will see and hear what we call the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And He will come and He will take over and He will have preeminence and He will have schedule. And we will be patient to listen to speak, to hear, and to respond to what he is doing. So this is Christmas. We have the trees up. If we could pull me down just a touch, I've got just a little bit of ring. Again, we're talking about the anticipation, the awesome wonder of the coming of the newborn king. We've looked at in this series, we're calling It's a Wonderful Life. We have looked at the names of Jesus, these last few I am statements, if you will, as found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 6. If you have your Bibles, you'll want to prepare uh, for there. We have talked about Jesus being the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Last week, we spoke about the everlasting Father. And if we look at Isaiah verse, chapter 9 and verse 6, we see there's one more name that is attributed. And it says this, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So today we're going to turn our attention to that final dimension, that last statement of of this prophetic revelation. We're going to look at the majestic uh, name that is bestowed upon Jesus, our Savior. We're going to look at the Prince of Peace. We've talked about tapestry. We've talked about the weaving together of of yarn on on a mat and how on the backside, it doesn't look like anything in particular, but when you turn it around, there is a, a masterpiece that is revealed. And this is another one of those pieces of yarn that we're going we're gonna to weave into this majestic tapestry, this beautiful piece of art that we call Jesus. Now, he's not just, obviously, a piece of art, but who he is is so awesome that we sit and we stand or we stand in awe of who he is. And as we look upon him, we find ourselves in awe. So we're going to look at the Prince of Peace, and we're going to look at it kind of in threefold. The first one we're going to look at is the peace of God. I'm sorry, is the peace with God. Second is the peace of God. And final is the promise of peace on earth. If I had to guess, I don't know the list of songs that we're going to sing tonight, but if I had to guess, one of them is going to sing something about peace on earth and goodwill towards man. All of us in this room today 
when, when met with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit as we just have been. Our hearts are open to receive what God wants to speak to us. And the message that He wants us to hear today based on our passage is that He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who gives us re- reconciliation and tranquility and brings divine order to our lives. And I hope as we dig into this particular time of Scripture, this particular moment of breaking open God's Word, I hope that you're going to find a deeper appreciation of such a profound peace that only Jesus can bring. Listen, I understand there are challenges and trials that are going to come to our lives. And they're going to upheave us. And I wish that I was immune to that. But then there are times when God says, hey, I've got this. And you go, okay. My hands are off. I'm out of the way. God, whatever you're going to do, you do. And I know that you're in charge. I've had a a situation like that in the last few years. There was a, a season where our oldest had come home from church camp, from youth camp. And this was a couple of years ago, three, four years ago. Um, He's not one to complain of pain. And he kind of started saying, hey, I've got some pain. I'm, I'm hurting. I can't eat, blah, 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 all those things. We take him to the doctor, not really thinking anything of it. I said, ah, we'll take you to the the urgent care tomorrow. So we get up and we go to urgent care. By nine o'clock, we're there. By about 945, we're in the hospital. I've had to take him over to the, to the hospital and they've admitted him because his appendix had ruptured. But it hadn't just ruptured. It wasn't just a small thing. It had, forgive the crassness, exploded. When they did surgery, by 11.30, he was already in surgery. So from 9 o'clock, not worried about, oh, we'll take you, it's okay. To 11.30 being in an OR. And the doctor came out and said, listen, we, we normally will go in, uh, we, we clean up the, the site, and we remove the appendix. He said, there was nothing there. There, were, there was no, this thing had just obliterated. And I wish I could say that that was the end of the story. But we spent two weeks in the hospital. Two long weeks for now, something that we just assumed that morning was nothing. And I said, hey, wait till tomorrow. And doctor bills started racking up. If you have ever gone to the hospital, you know how expensive that can be. But there was something in that process. And listen, I know it's easy to look and say, well, I'm the pastor and you, you know, it's no. I want it. I'm already by default. Listen. We all have our faults. By default, my family, I'm a worrier, okay? Everything causes me to worry. I stress about everything. It's just, it's just who I am. I know God's in charge, but it's just kind of who I am. But through that two weeks, there was not a care or concern in the world that I had. I wasn't worried about the money. I wasn't worried about anything other than we were praying for Brendan, and I knew that God had him in his hands. God immediately spoke and said, I've I've got this. I've I've taken care of this. And I can tell you, by the end of the process, two weeks later, he's finally discharged, two surgeries, lots of uh, things they call pick lines and uh, tubes, and I won't get too, too much into it, although most of you are in the medical field, so you probably already know what I'm talking about. And we get to go home. And I get that first bill from the hospital. And I'm kind of going down through it. Now, what you need to understand is I've left out some details. I worked at that time for the Assemblies of God National Office. And the HR lady said, hey, listen, I know the person fill out this this paperwork. We know the people at the hospital in their benevolence department. We'll see what we can do. Okay, but I didn't think anything of it. We got that first bill, and we go to start going down through total charges, a hundred and some thousand dollars. 
just, just over $100,000 for two weeks in the hospital, two surgeries, all the meds. He had to come home with a, I don't know what they call it, the little rolly stand thing with the drippy bag and all that stuff. And we had to, we had to do the changing of the bag and all these things, give any medicine through these, these things, meter and all that stuff. Next line down, paid. Next line down, paid. And the truth is, a $100,000 bill through gifts from our church at that time, from work. Letitia also worked at the national office and, and did things from her. We didn't end up owing anything. Not a dime. The Lord took care of it. And I know that there are some sitting here today who are going, I'm in the middle of chaos. And I felt like I needed to share this story with you. It's not actually even in my notes. Because you need to know that God sees you. He knows your situation. And all He's asking you to do is to speak Jesus. Because it's that kind of peace, speaking Jesus over the situation. It's that kind of peace that we talk about when we say that there is peace that passes understanding. I should have been in full out panic. A hundred thousand dollar bill for hospital. I don't know if you know how much pastors make. It's not a lot. It's not, it's not a career path that, that people go into for the money. That would have been the end of us financially. We would have been paying on that until Jesus came. But through all of the trial and all of the difficulty, Jesus was the answer and the peace that passes understanding. And so that's what I want us to hear as we go through our message today. First thing, if you're a note taker, I want us to look at is the peace with God. In all of this information and in all of the things that we can look at, I want us to look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Of course, it's always on the screen. If you're following along in the Logos or the Faith Life Bible app, it'll pop it up for you. It says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Listen, I could get shouty here. I could get loud. I could get excited. But very often in our, our, our scriptures, it says that God spoke in a still small voice. Sometimes we just need to be, have the voice of the Lord say, I've got it. I've taken care of it. That's all you need to know. I can look back on my life as a Christian, as a pastor, as a parent, as a husband, and every time God has spoken to me, it has been in that still small voice, and He says, I've taken care of it. I've got it. It wasn't some big grandiose gesture. It wasn't some big sign that when I was a very young man, I used to say God would have to speak to me through big flashing neons that said, hey, stupid that way. Because I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't see him. I wouldn't see what he was doing. But thank the Lord today, all he has to say is I've got it. And might I tell you today, the Lord's got it. He's got whatever situation you have to bring to him. All you need to do is speak Jesus over it, and he's got it. There's been all kinds of people who have tried to have peace with God, all kinds of missions uh, through religious ritual. There's been, through the ages, missions and endeavors have looked, th sought to try to bring peace to people through all kinds of different things, whether it's following, you know, look at the, the Pharisees. 
I want to have peace with God, so I'm going to create a rule so that I don't get touch the rule, so that I don't touch the rule. And so then now we live in this, this group of, of, of rules that are so convoluted that they're nowhere near what God has asked for us. And we need to be careful today not to follow suit. We need to be careful today to know that we have open access to the Father. All we need do is speak Jesus and He will come and He will hear and He will answer. You don't need me. You don't need an intermediary to speak to God for you. You have direct access to Him. People have looked to have peace with God through all kinds of works. People do this with genuine hearts, I think. There are people who, who genuinely think that if I can just do enough, if I can just say enough, if I can just work enough, then God will, will have His peace over me and it'll be okay and things will be right. Or they'll try to, again, the rules upon rules, they'll try to live this, this moral life. Well, I don't drink... Way back in the 70s, there was a song that said, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls that do. It's an opportunity. We, we try to live this moral life in thinking that, that somehow our act is going to make us right with God and is going to bring us peace. We've talked about this one before. People try to have peace with God. I'm going to write a big fat check. I'm going to lay out all kinds of money. See, Lord, I'm giving to your kingdom. Look, I, look, I helped them build the new wing on the building, and they put my name on it. See, look, Lord, look, what, look what kind of great good person I am. I, I paid money to the hospital, and, and I, I got a, a wing of the hospital named after me. And look at all of the children that, that have been helped because I donated all of these great things. There was in the church a season when donating was a sign of status. Times have changed. We know better now. But if I could even direct you so much as to the middle aisle, there's pews that have placards on the ends of them to the peop in memory or in, in acknowledgement of the people who gave money in hopes that that would be some status or some moment. I'm not disparaging the people who gave. They, I know they gave with a right heart and with a right motive. And that's okay. But giving doesn't buy peace with God. See, in finding peace with God... There's a great gulf, a huge space between the sinner, and our holy God. We talked about in Sunday school today about judgment. Brother Raph shared in our, 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 our lesson, and we talk about the way that we judge others. And we don't judge people outside the body the same way we judge or look at people inside the body. Because somebody who's outside the body, they're in chaos. They're in, they're in upheaval. They may not know it. They may be in a, a, a lull in their life at the moment, thinking that everything is okay. But there is an opportunity for them to have peace with God. But that chasm can only be spread, it can only be spanned by what? Speaking Jesus, by speaking Jesus over their life. That chasm, that bridge to peace with God can only be crossed, can only be bridged by the cross. So far it has been his only sermon that he has ever preached, but I was very proud of him. My son Brandon, one, son, one, one night in youth group, was given the opportunity to share the message. And the thing that he chose to share was an image of two mountains and a big chasm in between. 
And the bridge that was laying across it was the cross. And his entire message was this message today. That the only way to cross that bridge, the only way to get from chaos to peace, the only way to get from separation to life, peace that passes understanding, peace with God, is to bridge the cross of Jesus. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, you don't, it's not going to be on the screen. You, if you're a note taker, you can jot that down. Tells us that he paid our debt of sin. We no longer owe it. Isaiah's prophetic word find fulfillment as Jesus, the Lamb of God, pays the debt of our sins on the cross. In his suffering and sacrifice, he takes upon himself the weight of our iniquities, bringing redemption and reconciliation. Again, if you remember, I think we sang this once before. It used to be a song long time ago. He paid a debt I did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. Wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. It's amazing grace. I, Jesus, paid a debt that I could never pay. I like that you guys know those songs. Jesus broke down in, in the cross. He broke down all of the barriers. Ephesians chapter 2, if you're a note taker, 12 to 18. The cross becomes the intersection where divine love dismantles the barriers that sin puts up. It's easy to find ourselves in, in the midst of sin. Because here's what sin does. Sin seeks to separate. To separate you from God. Why? Because if He can isolate you from everything that God has for you, if He can isolate you in a, a way that you're not even seeing what God can do, now not only do you not have peace, but you can't see peace, so you have no hope. And then we find ourselves in the midst of all of this chaos. We don't even see that there's a way out of it. But here's the thing. Because Jesus died on the cross. What happened that day? When Jesus died on the cross and His life went out of Him. Darkness fell. And what happened to the temple? The curtain was rent in two. Why? Because we now have access. We now have direct access to the Father. And when Jesus died, He broke down the barrier, the separation between God and us. And He gives us an opportunity to come to Him directly. However, just because the curtain was rent in two, don't we still need to look through it? Don't we still need to seek? Don't we still need to make the effort to look? To find? And finally, the, the cross in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 says He made peace through His blood. Colossians kind of affirms or uh, this impact of Jesus' atonement. It, it says that His shed blood, pe through His shed blood, peace is not only possible, but it has been made a reality. The blood of the Prince of Peace becomes the eternal ink that inscribes our name into the book of life. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you heard a sermon on the book of life? Kind of been a long time, been a little while. The fact that there is a book, a heavenly book, that our name is written in. And that one day we'll stand before the Father and our name, the roll call, will be made. And if our name is not written down in the Lamb's book of life, 
the statement will be, depart from me, for I never knew you. My name written in that book is all the peace that I need. Is all of the hope that I need. Because I know that if my name is written in the blood of Jesus, there is nothing in this world that could ever blot it out. There is no divine eraser. There is no divine scribble. When we talk about peace with God, we find that in faith in Jesus and what He did for us. The Apostle Paul, he, his words state this. The peace with God is not achieved through human effort but is received as a gift through faith in Jesus. I wish that I could say that my peace, that my, my relationship was something that I did, but I'm so grateful that I can't. That the peace that I have wasn't because I did something, because then I'd worry. Right? If it was something that I did, if, if I had some divine act that I could commit, then I would worry that there would be some divine act that I would do that would take it away. But because it wasn't my act, it wasn't my thing to do to save me, I have the peace to know that there's nothing I can do that will ever take me out of the middle of His hand. Number two is that we're going to look at is the peace of God. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 to 8. It says, Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Peace with God is unchanging. It is the absolute foundation of what we believe as a Christian. It is the absolute bedrock of who and what we are. It is, is who Jesus is in our faith in Christ are, is secured by what He did on the cross. But make no mistake, peace with God is dependent on our relationship with Him. Again, those outside the body they are not offered the free gift that God gives us. And so as we are inside the body of Christ, as we are one with Him, we have peace that can pass any understanding. See, there's a lot of people who have peace with God. But many miss the peace of God. There's all kinds of stuff that happens in our life. And we simply don't open up. We've talked a lot about gifts. It's always a, a, an easy thing because of Christmas and we see packages under the tree. But so many of us don't open up the package that God's given us. He says, listen, if you will just submit if you will just speak my name, 
I'll come in and I'll give you a piece that you can't understand. Your brain wants to try to rationalize, wants to try to explain, wants to try to, to, to have all of the details in order. But Jesus says, if you'll just accept me, the chaos that you're going through, I can speak it gone. So how do we have a path to peace? Well, guess what? Our passage gives us that. We don't have to guess. We don't, this isn't an ethereal concept that is only able to be understood by great study and, and dis, dis, discerning the Word of God. What does verse 6 say in our passage in, in Philippians? It says, don't be anxious about anything. The Apostle Paul, under divine inspiration, provides a road map to the peace of God. And it begins with a radical surrender of anxiety. Hello? <laughs> In a world that is more and more and more dependent on all kinds of things, we're, but we are called to cast our burdens upon the Lord. Father, I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet this week, but I know you know how they're going to end. And whatever happens, I know that you're in charge of my life. So I'm not going to worry about it because you've already taken care of it. Number two, first path, if you will, is be anxious about nothing. Number two is to pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. It's really simple. And it's prayer that becomes the conduit through which our soul pours out its concerns and petitions before the throne of God. It is in this sacred dialogue that the peace of God finds fertile ground to take root in us. Very often you will hear me say, if you have received your prayer language, pray in that. Why? Why? Because we don't get caught up in the, oh, I can't ask the Lord for, God, I've asked you for that so many times. Lord, I feel like a broken record. I don't. <sighs> you ever prayed like that? But sometimes when you pray in your prayer language, your prayers are from, from the depths of your heart, from the depths of your spirit. And so we pray in our prayer, prayer language so that my brain, my humanness, my anxiety, my, my worries, my stuff doesn't get in the way of what my heart, what my spirit wants to cry out to the Father. And so we don't worry about anything, we pray about everything. And I would add, pray in the Spirit. He even tells us in another place, in all things, pray. And, and if you can, pray in the Spirit. Continue on in our passage. Number three is to give thanks so we don't worry, we pray, we give thanks without ceasing. Being thankful for what He has done. God, listen, I don't know how in the world you're going to make this work, but I thank you for it in advance. Sometimes when you have been down here in the altar, you will have he heard me pray over you. Father, we, we ask these things knowing that you're a God who hears but also that is willing to answer. And so, Father, we thank You already for the answer in the, for this, this need. We know, we pray, receiving that answer, being grateful, because we know it may not be today, it may not be this week. We don't know God's plans, but we are grateful for when the answer comes, regardless. Amen? And number four. Down in verse 8, it tells us to think only about praise. Giving thanks, lifting up. If we allow our, our brain to always be on the negative, always to be on doubt, always to be on, on the negative side of things, then that's where we'll go. What does our passage say? 
Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Think on these things and offer those up. If we can follow this blueprint, if we can follow the path that is laid out, then that's what we get, we get when we have the peace that passes understanding. The result of doing this, of praying, worrying, don't worry about anything, pray about everything, and everything give thanks, and to think on things that are, are praiseworthy. The result of living that kind of life is a peace that passes all understanding. Then we're going to come to our final, our, our Christmas season statement, if you will. Number three, if you're the, a note taker, is peace on earth. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4 gives us a picture of our future reality. It says, The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. Amen? How many are ready for that? Luke chapter 2 and verse 14 gives us that, that familiar passage of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It was an angelic proclamation over Bethlehem that has now echoed through all of time since. And it does something. It foreshadows peace that extends beyond individual people's hearts but encompasses nations. It is the birth of the Prince of Peace that initiates this cosmic ripple, this, this continuation. And it brings in a new era that we will one day be part of. I don't know where you're at for this holiday season, but as we close, for some of us, Pastor Jonathan echoed so wonderfully, Christmas is not necessarily a time of peace on earth. For some of us, Christmas is a, a season of hurt, of pain. A lot, the pain of a lost loved one around the holiday season. The hurt of lack of finances to, to actively participate in the, the celebratory activities of, of the Christmas or Thanksgiving holiday. But for many of us, there's just an overwhelming sense of dread. The one thing that I can tell you beyond anything, no matter where you're at and what's going on, the best is yet to come. There is a hope if we look forward and we look at, at, at the prophetic tapestry, if you will, we stand on the precipice, the, the, the edge of a re reality where we will have peace on earth and goodwill to all men as we dwell with the Lord forever and ever in heaven. I know the word peace for some of us brings up other memories. I can tell you I know from, a, from prayer meetings that we have prayed for countries, home countries, that are in the, in the midst of challenge and war. We have prayed for families that are in the midst of, of challenges. We have prayed for job situations that are in chaos. So I'm going to ask you this question as we, as we begin to wrap up. Do you long for peace?
amidst all of the chaos and just the voices, the, the sounding gongs of this world. Do you long for the peace that passes understanding? Might I say once again, speak Jesus. Speak Jesus, and he will bring peace to your troubled heart. I want to echo our, our early passage, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Speak Jesus over your situation. And there is a day coming that he will bring peace to this troubled world. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this moment. There's so many things, Lord, that we could get excited about and shout about and your mercies and your, your, your Holy Spirit and the pouring out of your Spirit among your people, Father. But today it was a message of peace. And the world is shouting in our heads. The world is shouting to pull us in every direction. And sometimes, Lord, you want to speak in a still small voice. You want us to hear what you're calling. And you want us to react accordingly. So, Father, I pray for each person in this room. If they're in the midst of chaos, I pray peace over their situation. I pray the name of Jesus over their lives. I speak the name of Jesus over their lives today. May your Holy Spirit dwell in their hearts and in their lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't want to take an opportunity to miss if you are here and you have never asked Jesus into your life. You have never spoken Jesus over your own life. And you would like to do that today whether you're here physically or you're watching online. We would invite you to do that today. As we sing our closing song, we would invite you to come. We would love to pray with you. We would love to lead you to a relationship with Christ and, and share with you what it is to be a child of God so that you too can know that kind of peace. If you're in chaos and you need peace, we'll open the altars again. You can come. You don't have to come to anybody. You can simply come and meet Jesus at the altar. So as we sing, the altars are open. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Rhea Temple International Church Podcast. We hope that you've been blessed and inspired by today's message. To stay connected with our church community, download our BTIC app from your phone's app store or follow and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. We would love to hear your thoughts or questions on today's topic, so please feel free to share them with us in the comments or by sending us a message through the app. If you found today's episode helpful, please consider sharing it with a friend, a team member, or in social media. Your support helps us reach even more with these inspiring messages. As we close out today's episode, let us remember to keep working in the Lord's vineyard until Christ comes. Maranatha. And as always, don't forget to tune in next time for another inspiring message. See you soon.